Hi, I'm Stephen Salel, and at the museum, I curate shows on Japanese woodblock prints. I specialize in shunga, Japanese erotic art. Today, I want to talk about some of those prints. I realize there are kids here, so don't worry. My talk has a PG-13 rating. Last year, we held the first of three exhibitions about shunga. The second exhibition will begin this November. We've received positive reviews about this series so far. The fact that the work deals with sex doesn't mean that they can't be appreciated for other reasons as well. One challenge about this project is how to address people's attitudes about sexuality. Conservative viewers might feel it's improper to discuss sex in public, while more liberal viewers might feel that erotica does not promote healthy attitudes about gender. Erotic art doesn't merely cater to a heterosexual male audience. For example, many works of Shunga depict homosexual relationships. Both of these figures are male, and the fellow on the right is seducing the fellow on the left, who's trying to ease the sexual tension by preparing firewood. Some erotic art is quite nuanced and sophisticated. This image of a woman seducing her boyfriend is accompanied by a quotation of classical Chinese poetry. Flowers do not wait for the first spring wind to begin blossoming. Not all erotica is subtle and nuanced, of course. Sometimes it's downright silly. Here's a story of a boy being haunted by a monstrous vagina. Anthropomorphized genitalia is a pretty common trope in erotic art. In the second Shunga show, we'll discuss humorous erotica in depth. Erotic art often challenges our ideas about privacy. We usually think of sex as a private act. It's something that's incredibly intimate and requires a great deal of trust between those involved. Or does it? Perhaps that's our own culturally specific view. This is an image of the Yoshiwara brothel district outside of Edo City, and as you can see, there's nothing particularly private about this scene. The people involved are far from shy or ashamed. There didn't appear to be much stigma attached to commercialized sex, either. The guidebook to the Yoshiwara brothel district was one of the longest-running publications in the history of Japan, over 350 years. The guidebook told readers which brothels were better than others, and the courtesans were individually named and ranked as well. When a courtesan was hired by a patron, there was nothing secretive about their meeting. On the contrary, the courtesan, accompanied by her attendants, literally led a parade from her residence down the main street of the Yoshiwara and over to the meeting house where her client was waiting. Even when a courtesan was meeting with a client, they might be interrupted by the courtesan's assistant delivering a message from another patron. Here we see the assistant handing over the message while covering the current client's eyes so that he doesn't read it. Just as courtesans showed little shame about their work, artists proudly signed their names to explicitly erotic images. In this non-explicit cover sheet to a Shunga portfolio, the artist's name is incorporated into the design in one of the kimonos. Though the Yoshiwara was the most famous brothel district, houses of prostitution could be found throughout the country. And as travel along highways such as the Tokaido increased, these smaller independent pleasure houses became increasingly well known, as this travel, travel guide shows. When we think of famous artworks in the genre of ukiyo-e, we often think of Hiroshige and his depictions of landscapes along the Tokaido Highway. Rarely do people realize that a lot of those landscapes are actually scenes of brothels. Some areas along the Tokaido, such as Oiso, are imbued with a sense of romance. When it rains in Oiso, people say that Lady Tora is crying over the death of her lover. They often neglect to mention that Lady Tora was a prostitute and that her lover was actually her client. 
This is a revised version of Hiroshige's famous landscape, Kambara. Courtesans were such popular figures in prints that if a print designer wanted to publicize his landscape prints, he might republish them with the image of a prostitute standing in front of each one. And again, it's important to emphasize that when I talk about sexualized depictions of individuals, I'm talking about both men and women, as well as third gender individuals, much like the ladyboys in contemporary Thailand or the hijra in modern India. As we move into the 19th century, we see a number of erotic artworks that depict foreigners, just as depictions of sexuality expanded from areas like the Yoshiwara to places all throughout the country, eventually we begin to see depictions of interracial relationships. As Japan becomes more internationalized in the early 20th century, we see the depictions of sexuality become more westernized. This portrait by Hashiguchi Goyo seems largely influenced by European ideas about the demure nude. In the third Shunga exhibition, scheduled for 2014, will feature works by contemporary artists such as Yumiko Glover. I hope this presentation shows that the genre of Shunga is still alive and well and worth discussing. Thank you very much for your time.